I hadn't mentioned why the hoteling rule is named, uh, whom the hoteling rule is named after. It's named after Harold Hoteling, who wrote a famous paper in the early 1930s, I believe 1931, on the economics of exhaustible resources. Hoteling was, I think, the most important mathematical economist in the generation just before World War II. Now, Paul Samuelson was a graduate student at that time. He became an extremely important mathematical economist just after World War II. Hotelling uh, was also, it turns out, the inventor of the travel cost method, which we studied when we talked about environmental valuation, and contributed to quite a few different areas of economics in a pretty profound way. This article that I wrote in the early 1930s, though, used the calculus of variations, which was a mathematical technique which physicists have, had been using since the 1700s, but economists had practically never used it before. It's an advanced mathematical technique. Uh, and it, it seems like most economists couldn't understand Hotelling's paper, and you really don't see many comments about the paper until the 1960s and 1970s when economists caught up with the mathematics that Hotelling used in the 1930s and understood this as being really the foundational paper for the neoclassical economics of exhaustible resources. Uh, Hotelling was a professor, I believe, at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill at the time. He had also taught at Stanford and at Columbia. One of his students was Kenneth Arrow, whom you'll recall from earlier in this semester, won the Nobel Prize for the Arrow Impossibility Theorem. Now, we, I was going to discuss the hoteling rule and illustrate this idea that marginal profit rises at the rate of interest. One way to illustrate it is to go back to our graph in the upper left. Marginal profit is the slope of total profit. So to say that marginal profit rises at the rate of interest is to say that, uh, the, you, see, you see, you couldn't start at 15 tons, because if you started at 15 tons, marginal profit would be zero. And then, well, you could. But if margin profit was zero, then rising at the rate of interest would be zero forever, and margin profit would be zero forever, and therefore quantity would be 15 forever, and we know that that's not feasible. So what else is feasible? Margin profit, it, it turns out, should be positive and rising at the rate of interest. So it starts out at a pretty small value. Maybe I should. To illustrate this. So, what we're trying to do is illustrate marginal profit versus time rising in this kind of exponential way. Uh, to say that it rises at the rate of interest, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a percent increase that rises at the rate of interest, and that means that it's an exponential increase. So, marginal profit starts out low and then gets higher and higher. So in the graph on the upper left, marginal profit is the slope of total profit. So we have to have we have to have a slope that starts out low, close to zero, like here. And then as time goes on, the slope has to get higher and higher. So that's the pattern. We have a slope that first is low and then it gets higher and higher. Now, what does that mean in terms of where we are in the graph? Well, we start out at a point like this, point number one, and then we go point like this, point number two, and then a point like this, point number three. Because if you start out at one, it has a low marginal profit, then you go to two, it has a higher marginal profit, then you go to three, it has an even higher marginal profit. So this is what the pattern of marginal profit rising at the rate of interest translates into. It translates into points 1, 2, and 3. Notice one, point 1 has this kind of total profit, point 2 has this kind of total profit, point 3 has this kind of total profit. So when you go from 1 to 2 to 3, total profit is actually falling. So we have marginal profit rising at the rate of interest, but total profit is falling. 
Now, this makes some sense. The firm would love to be able to stay at 15 tons of Q forever, because that maximizes short-run profit. But it can't because it's going to run out of the resource. So the, what the hoteling rule says intuitively is that what it does is it starts out at a point like, like 1, which is pretty close to 15 tons. Then as the years go on, it moves to a point like 2 and a point like 3 that are farther and farther away from the 15 ton short run optimal. But it's gonna ha it can't stay at 15 tons of output forever, so it's going to have to sacrifice some time. And what the hoteling rule says is, you don't sacrifice in the beginning. Or at least you don't sacrifice much in the beginning. In the beginning, you stay uh, pretty close here to 15 tons. Where you sacrifice is in later time periods. And the reason why you want to sacrifice in later time periods and not in earlier time periods is because later time periods, not the time value of money, discounting. Later time periods, money, profit isn't worth as much as profit is in earlier time periods. So you're going to have to sacrifice some time. You don't want to sacrifice current profits because each current dollar is really important you will sacrifice future profits because future profits are less important because of discounting. And that's what the hoteling rule shows, that you're sacrificing future profits, but you're not sacrificing present profits very much. One, one could therefore draw graphs like this. You have total profit versus time is falling. Also, quantity versus time is falling. Here we can show that this way. This is the quantity in time period 1, quantity in time period 2, quantity in time period 3. So quantity is falling. Another way of illustrating the hoteling rule is in the following graph. So here I'm going to draw demand and supply. The demand curve is seen by the firm as being the marginal revenue curve. And I'm going to draw a supply, a supply curve which is the marginal cost curve. Now this is the short run supply curve. This is the supply curve that we've used to describe firm behavior before this chapter. It doesn't actually describe firm behavior in this chapter, so in this chapter it's the marginal cost interpretation of this line which is important. The, actually the supply interpretation of this line is, is, is less important. Now the hotel rule talks about marginal profit rising at the rate of interest. Marginal profit is, in the upper left, the slope of total profit. Another way to think about it is that marginal profit is marginal revenue minus marginal cost. We've seen that in previous chapters. Well, in the bottom right-hand graph, we have marginal revenue and we have marginal cost, and therefore marginal profit is the gap between marginal revenue and marginal cost. So let me repeat. So marginal profit is the, uh, maybe I'll write it down. Marginal profit is the gap between marginal revenue and marginal cost. So on the bottom right, we have marginal revenue, we have marginal cost. So the gap between them is marginal profit. And the hoteling rule says that marginal profit rises at the rate of interest. So what that means is that that marginal profit, it, it starts out small, and then it gets, let's say, time number one. And then in time number two, it gets bigger. Time number three, it gets bigger. Time number four, it gets bigger. So this is marginal profit. And this is an illustration of marginal profit rising at the rate of interest. The, it can't marginal profit can't be zero because if zero rose at the rate of interest it would be zero forever and then you'd be stuck at this quantity forever 
and being stuck at any particular quantity forever is not feasible. You can look at what happens here to quantity. Quantity at point one is time one is here at uh, sorry. Let me draw this a little differently. Quantity at time one is here, quantity at time two is here, quantity at time three is here, quantity at time four is here. So quantity is falling which is exactly the same conclusion we came to in the upper left-hand graph, and it's the same one we illustrated over here, that quantity falls over time. So this is consistent. Some sources, and I believe your book does this too, use a, use a much more awkward term than marginal profit. There are actually several alternative terms. Marginal profit is by far the best term, but another term that's used is user cost. This is particularly unfortunate because um, user cost implies that it's something bad. Uh, marginal profit in and of itself is really neither bad nor good. Profit is good, um, marginal profit is uh, is not necessarily bad, so user cost is a somewhat awkward term uh, for this. Um, and then, then this this here is marginal cost. This this part. So, in some interpretations, you have marginal cost from here to here and then marginal user cost from here to here. I said I, I don't think that's the, um, the best interpretation. Uh, the best interpretation is that, that indeed marginal cost is from here to here. Uh, this is the marginal revenue curve, so marginal revenue is from here to here. And the gap between marginal cost and marginal revenue is marginal profit exactly as it's drawn here. So this is the, the basic explanation of the hotel rule and, and how it functions. In the next video, we're going to take a somewhat more critical look at the hoteling rule.